Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. Well, we're taking a break from requests for a moment to do a movie that I've requested. It's been on my list for ages, and I'm finally super happy that Craig, independently of me, decided, eh, uh, let's give this one a whirl. It is 1985's Demons, an Italian horror film. And you know I love me some Italian horror films. <laughs> <laughs> Especially uh, when they're associated with one Dario Argento. Now, I was under the mistaken impression for years that Dario Argento actually directed this movie. But although when you look at the box cover, his name is prominently displayed, it's one of those, a film presented by Dario Argento. Right. Uh, and it turns out that the director of this movie is actually Lamberto Bava. Now, Lamberto Bava is the son of Mario Bava. Mario Bava would be a contemporary of Dario Argento, uh, Lucio Fulci. I know those were kind of like the three names, really, of, uh, of Giallo and horror in Italy in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Mario Bava did some really, really great stuff, and his son worked on some of his films as well as he grew up and uh, followed in his footsteps a bit uh, and went off in the horror direction. I'm really a fan of Mario Bava. I know we're going to do some movies uh, by him at some point, Um, but Dario Argento did have a hand in this. Lamberto Bava did get around and, and work on Argento's films, uh, and so this movie well, he came after he did a giallo called A Blade in the Dark, an action film called Blast Fighter, a science fiction horror film called Monster Shark, uh, and then he wanted to do a, a trilogy. His father did a, a movie called Black Sabbath. That's the movie that kind of started out his own little trilogy. And, you know, Argento has his trilogy that started out with Suspiria, that kind of thing. Even Fulci has his trilogy, right? The started out with City of the Dead and then goes into Beyond. I, th- I think he calls it the... Beyond Trilogy or City of the Dead Trilogy. I don't know. Trilogies are a thing, right? So um, he wanted this film to kick off a trilogy, and in some ways it did. There is a sequel to this, although apparently it's less successful. We haven't seen it. Uh, And there was a third movie in this series as well that he also directed. Um, It's written uh, by a guy named Dardano Sacchetti, and the writers came and went. Um, Argento came and gave some opinions about it, blah, blah, blah. In the end, for a movie that kind of comes from this pedigree (laughs) and has all these different really well-known hands helping it out, I'm really surprised at what we ended up getting out of it. Or maybe I shouldn't be? (laughs) I don't know. Like, Italian horror is just this crazy thing. It's it's almost all exploitive, right? Just like um, Mm -hmm. the spaghetti westerns were of the western genre. But just like the spaghetti westerns, you get some real gems in there, like some real art craftsmanship and some artistry. And then to balance it out, you get some utter, just mindless, meaningless garbage that's just there to throw gore effects at you. And I do sort of feel like this movie falls significantly in that realm. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. It really just depends on what you're in the mood for. So I'd seen this on the shelves forever. It's been on my list forever. I was really happy to watch it. Craig, what made you decide that this was the week we're going to do Demons? I was, uh, you know, just looking around the internet and on one of the horror movie websites that I frequent, they did an article about horror movies that take place at the movies. And I had seen a couple of them. In fact, uh, we did popcorn on the show, uh, which was fun, and I enjoyed that. And I was just kind of thinking, well, since we can't go to the movies right now, uh, <laughs> why don't we uh, why don't we watch a movie about going to the movies? There you go. And I thought that we had maybe talked about it in passing, and I figured it would be something that would be right up your alley, and it looked uh, interesting. So. And, and you know, it's it's one of those movies that, for whatever reason, I, I see the title of and imagery from, you know, just in web articles and, and uh, horror film documentaries and that type of thing. But I had never seen it, and so I thought, let's, let's give it a shot, see what it's all about. Well, it's all about something. It's all about a lot of stuff. But you're right, this movie takes place in a movie theater, and it gets a little meta in the beginning, and then kind of goes off in all these crazy directions, I think, in the middle. Well, I mean, I didn't actually sit down like I normally do and take notes on the plot. 
I kind of assumed that this was going to be an easy one to remember. And uh, whether or not we choose to do a play-by-play of every scene, you know, in this movie, there really isn't, like you often say, there really isn't a lot to this. No, yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's the plot is extremely simple. The characters are just, um, who cares, right? I mean, there's they're memorable people in here, uh, but they're like they're like cardboard cutout stereotypes, right? Pretty much. It's very much. A movie goers movie I guess there's it's just a a big adventure kind of flick for people who like gore I kind of think it starts out really promising with some great tension and cinematography I thought of this woman named Cheryl who's coming home from school or something and she's on the subway and she feels like she's being followed at some point the the platform empties but she hears footsteps behind her and I thought it was that was a really quite a good scene actually um, and it turns out to be this man uh, who is wearing kind of this half mask. It's a silvery demon mask on half his face and apparently is some kind of gimmick for he is handing out free tickets to a screening of a brand new horror movie at a local theater. I'm not sure where this is supposed to take place. I know it was filmed in Berlin. I guess it's supposed to take place in Berlin, too, because they don't really do anything to try to to make it look like another city, right? Right. So she's in the Berlin subway, and she gets two tickets to the screening at the Metropol. And she talks to another friend of hers named Kathy, and they end up going in together to the theater, and they meet up with some friends. Now, I don't know if these were people that they that they knew beforehand. I guess they kind of were. No, 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 no. The, I mean, well, first, I just wanted to say that the guy in the mask that you were talking about, that... As far as design goes, that was one of my favorite things from the whole movie. That mask was really cool. It was like kind of a mm. 80s metal Phantom of the Opera mask in mm. that it just covered half of his face, but it also kind of seemed like the mask was fused to his face, like the edges of it were maybe kind of under his skin. And it was a uh, pretty scary, but at the same time, if you saw somebody in that costume handing out, you know, flyers or tickets for a free movie you'd probably just think oh wow great makeup but uh you know in the context of the movie you're thinking oh okay who is this guy Mm -hmm. uh but yeah they go uh to the metropole and there's a whole big scene of just the patrons arriving and it's just a whole hodgepodge of like you said stereotypical people like the black kind of shafts pimp type guy and uh, he's got a couple of girls with him and they're kind of the troublemakers Uh, you've got Cheryl and Kathy who are the kind of naive school girls though you know they're clearly women they're not young young girls Um, and they meet up with a couple of guys George and Ken George I would say is your typical 80s good looking guy he reminded me of uh, the bad guy from Karate Kid he kind of mm-hmm. looked like that guy mm-hmm. and uh, the two guys are kind of flirting with the girls they end up going down and sitting right next to them in this big theater to watch this screening and there's just like I said a hodgepodge of other people um, a blind guy gets led in by a beautiful woman who at first I thought was <laughs> his girlfriend but I think it ended up that maybe it was his daughter i wasn't real sure about that um a a kid named tom in like a sailor shirt (laughs) and (laughs) his girlfriend hannah and then just a bunch of other random people it's not a full theater but there's quite a few people there uh and they sit down to watch this movie And, and they don't even know what it is like before they go in kathy's like Oh, I hope it's not a horror movie. I hate horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> but when they go in, even in the lobby, like the lobby is decked out like all kind of scary art deco with kind of, you know, horrific imagery. And, and there's one prominent featured thing in the middle, which is a motorcycle of all things or like a dirt bike or something with this scary looking silver mask hanging off of it and uh, at one point one of the girls who was with Tony um, Rosemary puts the mask on and is like you know goofing around um, oh don't I look scary that kind of thing 
when she takes the mask off, um, it cuts her face. Just just a little cut on her face, but enough to draw blood. And anybody who's seen these kind of movies knows that's not a good sign. Bad news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But then they get into the, the theater, and the movie starts, and it seems like a pretty typical 80s horror movie. You've got, you know, a couple of couples, young people, riding motorcycles around this scary old mansion. And through their dialogue, meanwhile, we keep cutting back and forth. We cut back and forth from the movie within the movie to the people in the audience kind of reacting. And the people in the audience are pretty darn scared (laughs) (laughs) right away. They're "Ah!" utterly terrified. (laughs) A scary house. (laughs) Lame-ass dialogue. (laughs) According to an old legend, Nostradamus was buried here. Nostradamus? Sounds like a rock group to me. Yeah, Top of the Pops in 1500. They had rock groups then? Edith. So tell me, computer brain. Well, he was kind of a fortune teller. A prophet from the 16th century. He predicted a whole mess of things that have come true. Such as? Such as, for example, the discovery of Neptune and Uranus. Hitler. World Wars. The coming of the demons. Big deal. That hasn't happened. Not yet. Still time. And the dialogue, too, is all dubbed. Now, I didn't read too much about this. Did they film it in English and then just dub other actors' voices over? Because it looked like their mouths pretty much matched up with what they were saying, but it was clearly a dub. Yeah, and like a lot of these Italian films, in order to save money or just to kind of get a a certain quality level, uh, they would often film them in English and then... Uh, you know, maybe half of the actors are Italian or, or somewhat international, so maybe their English isn't that great, but, you know, they can speak it, but we don't care too much for their voice, and so another actor will come in and just dub the same English over them. I think some of the actors did, in fact, dub their own dialogue, but the fact of the matter is that even those who probably you're hearing their voice, it still got dubbed afterwards. And that does lead, you know, that's something you kind of have to get over when you're watching these Italian, these older Italian films is that it does lend a certain annoyance, I guess. You can tell it's dubbed, right? Yeah, it's yeah, not. you can tell. It's not just the, the, the lips don't quite match up or whatever, but sometimes the line... The sound quality. Yeah, it's just a little too perfect, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah. So. And, and it didn't bother me. I mean, typically, you know, if I'm watching a foreign film and I have the choice of watching it in the original language with subtitles or the dub, usually, unless I'm feeling really lazy, um, I'll watch in, in the original language with the subtitles because there are nuances in people's performances based on their voices. In this, I noticed right away that it was a dub but like you said i just got over it very quickly and and whereas it was very obvious to me in the beginning by the end i i yeah. wasn't even thinking about it so it was not that big a deal but anyway this movie's going on and and these kids in the movie are at this old mansion or or something and uh, one of the girls finds a plaque or something on the outside wall. Look! There's something written on this. It's an inscription or something. What's it say? They will make cemeteries, their cathedrals, and tombs your cities. Which I believe is the tagline for our movie. In fact, it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Funny how they tied that in. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good. You know, it's just kind of some silly nonsense where they're like, oh, legend has it that Nostradamus was buried here. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Nostradamus prophesied the coming of demons. And so they explore for five seconds until <laughs> they find Nostradamus's tomb. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> I love this. And I could I could only see this movie within a movie as a parody of horror movies. I mean it's not it can't be anything but it's so ridiculous. The dialogue is so bad and so stilted. Not that this movie has the best dialogue in the world, but but this movie within the movie tops it a hundred percent. And uh, yeah, they find Nostradamus's tomb like nothing. <laughs> yeah, but 
you know, if, strangely enough, I felt like the quality of the movie they were watching was almost identical to the quality of the movie that we were watching. Like, I I assume they were directed by... I assume that the movie within the movie was also directed by Lumberto Bava. Because uh, well, very similar in tone. They originally um, had planned to use another film, I think one of Fulci's movies, uh, as the movie within a movie. But at least that was suggested to save costs. And I think that both Argento and Lamberto decided, you know, kind of pushed, no, we, we really need to make our own film within this film. And so that's what they ended up doing. I'm glad they did. I mean, it's fun. And immediately, you know, like you said, there's like some meta stuff going on because in Nostradamus's tomb, they find a book written in Latin, of course. One of the guys is like, oh, it's in Latin. I can't read it. Wait, yeah, I can. <laughs> oh, wait, I, I forgot. I do read Latin. <laughs> so he reads something, and he and and they in there they also find a mask, the same mask that was out in the lobby. One of the guys is goofing around and puts on the mask, and the guy who's reading the Latin book is like, oh, no, don't do that. No, he says, don't do that. How do I look? Whoever wears it becomes a demon. How do you know? It says here, whoever wears it becomes a demon. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty funny. So anyway, he, he puts on the mask, and then he's goofing around, and the girls are like, it's not funny, take it off. So uh, he takes it off, and just like with Rosemary, the mask cuts him as well on the face. Uh, same exact place that looks just the same as it looks on Rosemary's face. At that very moment, Rosemary reaches up to touch the wound on her face, and it's bleeding again. And so she excuses herself to the bathroom, and even on the way to the bathroom, you can tell that something's off, like she's feeling sick, something's not right. She gets to the bathroom, and she's looking in the mirror, and she's looking at her face. And right away, you can tell, oh, here it comes, like... Here comes the first big effect because you can tell that one half of her face is now, you know, synthetic, some makeup, plastic, whatever it is. And she's poking at the thing on her face and it swells up like a zit from hell and pops (laughs) all over in a very disgusting and all over. And, you know, there's other things going on in the theater, like the girl who brought in the blind guy is boning some guy in the back. Like, I don't even I don't even know what was going on there. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to sound, you know, insensitive or whatever, but bringing the blind man to the movie theater. I mean, I know I know as a blind person, you can go see movies, but I, I feel like. In this film, they kind of made fun of it a little bit. Oh yeah, because, it was a joke. Because she's turning to him, and she's and, and, and he's asking her like questions, like, "Are they going into the tomb now?" And she's like, "Yeah." And he says, "Liz, yes. Are you scared?" Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I'm scared too. Like, what the hell? Have these people never seen a movie with any tension in it whatsoever? Yeah, and he's totally a movie talker. It's funny. It's like going to the movies with uh, my dad. My dad's a big movie talker. And I'm like, Dad, oh, no. shh, just watch it. <laughs> uh, I don't know I either. I'm watching it too. <laughs> <laughs> my first time too. Don't ask me these questions. <laughs> uh, but anyway, okay, so then the other girl who was with Tony gets up to go check on Rosemary. And she goes into the bathroom, and and she sees blood all over the sink. And I think she hears maybe some whimpering or something from the stall. So she goes, and and she looks, and um, she finds Rosemary in one of the stalls. But Rosemary is kind of huddled down so that you can't see her face. You can only see the back of her head. And when she finally turns around, she's full-out demon. She's got, like, crazy green demon eyes, and her face is all gross and veiny and hussy and nasty and she's got these you know long witchy fingers with uh crazy long nails and so she chases rosemary chases the other girl through the lobby into like a curtain maze (laughs) yeah it's well and and like she swipes at her and gets like she claws her neck like this other girl has a huge claw wound on her neck 
And you're right. First, she ends up like in a curtain maze, like she's trapped in these theater curtains. I don't even know what that was all about. But she ends up behind the screen of the film. And I, why is it that that I always get excited? Like, <laughs> it's like this, it's like the scene in Gremlins when they end up behind the screen and yes, uh, I don't know. It's just something magical. Like, ooh, I've never been behind the screen before. <laughs> It's like I'm in the movie. I know. <laughs> uh, and it's fun because she's like this. Apparently, this being a demon is transferable. It's like zombies. Like if you get bit or yeah. scratched or, or whatever, then you're infected too. And so this other girl's behind the screen and she starts transforming and she's screaming and moaning Meanwhile, on the screen, people have turned into demons and are, cha- you know, like the guys are demons and they're chasing the girls around and there's stabbing and all kinds of other gore effects going on there. But the people in the audience start to see or hear that the screams sound too real. And uh, the girl, Kathy, is like, no, something's wrong. There's somebody behind the screen. And eventually, this chicky pops through bursts through the screen and falls uh, to the ground and everybody kind of gets up and surrounds her and she goes through the transformation right in front of their eyes and jumps up and starts chaos and then that is basically the rest of the movie. Like, (laughs) (laughs) the, 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 the the movie within the movie is over and now it is just demons chasing people around in this theater in which they are mysteriously and supernaturally trapped for the next 45 minutes (laughs) yeah i mean that's basically all we can say about it i think (laughs) it gets just more and more crazy and you know when you when you watch the movie you you realize and it was only after they showed a full shot of the audience and they they did this fairly early on that i realized there aren't a ton of people in this theater Uh -uh. and so what's kind of funny is is that the whole audience gets up as a group (laughs) goes up to investigate you know this one demon lunges out at them at and then they kind of take care of it as a group. And then as a group, they all go down the aisle to go outside and start clawing at the doors, which, like you said, there's suddenly a wall where the entrance should be. Um, And then, you know, they turn back and they go back into the theater and they start. It's way too easy to kick the chairs of this movie theater over, separate them from the floor and start piling them up by the doors. But they do that in order to keep the demons out. There's a whole bunch of going around and investigating. And at one point they think it's the projector. They say, oh, the movie's doing this. You saw what happened to Cheryl. She put on the mask and she got cut. I think it's the pimp who says this. She put on the mask and she got cut. That's what happened in the movie. So we got to go up and stop the movie. And so then they go up into the screening room as a group. It's like 15 people <laughs> go into oh, at least. the projection booth. Yeah. yeah. And and then, oh, my God, it's automatic. There hasn't been a person here this whole time. So they smash up the machines. And in the meantime, the blind guy's handler, daughter, you said? I th- I guess. Like, like I said, I thought that it was... His girlfriend, but then I didn't understand why she was boning somebody else in the back. My favorite part was <laughs> before she was boning the guy in the back, this guy came down and sat next to her. I assume <laughs> she knew him before. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> She's sitting between the blind guy and this other guy, and she starts full out making out with the other guy, completely <laughs> unbeknownst to the blind guy right on the other side. Yes. And when I say and when I say making out, I'm being subtle because they were getting some hanky panky going on there. <laughs> Heavy petting, to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> and at that time, I was still thinking it was like his girlfriend, and I'm like, "Dang, you guys are like big thrill seekers!" Like, <laughs> but anyway, I think it was his daughter. It, it, it ultimately doesn't matter. But no, some girl. Yeah, she's she and the guy that she was making out with in the back had had a rope strung around both of their heads <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> like like tying them together. And I guess it, I don't know, there was lots of blood. Like, I guess uh, it was cutting into their skin or something. 
But the blind guy finds her dead, and then he gets his eyeballs clawed out. Which There's is a lot of blood, ironic. just period, in this movie. I mean, it's it's definitely the movie exists just to show us a bunch of gore. I mean, I'm pretty certain that that was the ultimate intent of this film. <laughs> that these effects are not bad, actually, for '80s lower budget special gore effects. The thing is, it's and what's kind of the problem with them is that they linger so long. I mean, it's just they want to show us every little bit of this effect that, you know, sometimes when you linger a little too long on these scenes, then you see that it's really just plastic and things are kind of stretching unnaturally. And, right. You know, and so it kind of loses a little bit of that. But but if this is the kind of thing you're into anyway, I think at one point um, one of the demons jumps up behind a guy and, like, digs her claws into his neck and, like, basically rips his neck open from the middle. Yep, yep. This guy, the blind guy, gets his eyes clawed out, hardy har har, um, you know, with two fingers in there and a hand in the mouth and just kind of almost like his skull is just, you know, candy to be crushed. Uh, yeah, and the pimp gets it in an interesting way. I don't remember how he got Do you remember? How did the pimp get it? Yeah, okay. So you were talking about how they were throwing all the chairs up in front of the doors. That is, they're actually in the balcony uh, at that point. So, no way. So it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but they... I guess quarantine themselves off in the balcony. Um, but the guy who'd been making out with the blind guy's daughter, the rope that he had been strangled with, I guess he had also been hung from the balcony with the rope. Yeah. Um, so then when, uh, they were, they were getting ready to cut the rope so that nobody, none of the zombies, I keep saying zombies. They're not, they're demons. Um, could, to keep them from climbing up it, they're going to cut the rope, but apparently they're too late because that guy gets up there and he attacks Tony. A couple of them attack Tony, and somehow they end up going over the balcony again, but then Tony and like both the zombies hanging off of him are just dangling from the rope, and uh, George, the good-looking hero guy, cuts the rope, and they drop down there and... <laughs> There's another scene. I don't remember who it was, but they're, they're fighting some demon on the balcony, and they throw it off the balcony right on top of this girl yeah. <laughs> who had been, like, hiding Escaping. in the aisles. <laughs> it's Hannah, the girl. Yeah. Um, but, like, she's, tra- you know, being all incognito, like, army crawling through, like, the seats. And they throw this demon right on top of her. And it, like, just pukes, like, <laughs> gallons of blood and pus all over her. And it goes on for, you know, probably not more than five seconds, but it's it feels a like lot. two minutes. It's a ton. <laughs> At one point, I couldn't figure out if he was puking blood or if the effect was supposed to be that he was chomping her down and blood was just spraying everywhere, but I'm pretty sure she, he was just puking blood because she does manage to get out from under him for a moment. But yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> it's so gross. Well, and then she's mysteriously okay and not covered in blood <laughs> <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> Don't really know how that works out. Big surprise. And like you said, it really is. I mean, there are breaks in the action because they do kind of, you know, seal themselves off and, and the demons kind of aren't getting to them. And some people like Hannah and her guy, Tom, the sailor shirt guy, are off on their own. And so they're trying to navigate by themselves. And there's a scene where they try to escape through the air vents um, yeah. which isn't as tense as I think they wanted it to be. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> what, they get like about 12 feet, <laughs> and, she, and they're in the vents, and she says something like, We're going to make it. This was a great idea. And then like two uh-huh. seconds later, like, Oh, my God, how are we going to get out of here? <laughs> And, like, a demon comes up behind them, right, in the air vents. I, I was confused what was happening at first because the, the boy, Tom, hears scratching behind him. And then um, we see the demony claws. So it seems like a demon is following them. But then they come to a fork, and he maneuvers and says, Hannah, you go ahead of me. And so she does, and he's like, wait a second, now it doesn't make any sense. Now it sounds like it's in front of us. Well, I finally figured out it's because Hannah was turning. It was her. She was the one making the noise. 
Oh. And her hands had already turned. And uh, eventually, after he says, wait a second, now it's in front of us, I don't get it, she turns around and she's a demon and she kills him. Ah. But, you know, you've, you've mentioned uh, the gore effects. You're right. The movie is just a vehicle for that. You know, the, the plot is just paper thin. But... I didn't mind at all. No. I do really like these older practical effects. They're fun to watch. Yes, they are. The first uh, person who turns, uh, the R girl, Rosemary, her transformation, while yes, clearly artificial, was really cool to watch. And, uh, you know, they had clearly built her whole head, and they do this. There was this whole effect where. Her tongue comes out, and it's like a foot long. Yeah. And you're right. They do linger on it a long time. And because they linger on it and because it's well lit, um, you can see. It's, you know, it's it's a dummy. It's it's not – it doesn't look real. But that doesn't mean it doesn't look cool. <laughs> yeah. It does look cool. And a lot of these effects did. And I liked that it was, you know, kind of soaked in blood, and they just really kind of went all out. I wouldn't say that this is my type of movie, but I had fun watching this movie. Yeah. I thought it was a lot of fun to watch. There were random things, like, so they're all, you know, holed up in the theater or whatever. Then all of a sudden, we're with a bunch of thugs in a car yeah. sno <laughs> snorting cocaine out of a Coca-Cola can. Out of a Coca-Cola can. <laughs> and at first, I thought that they were – because they're snorting it through a bendy straw. So at first, <laughs> I thought that they were literally sucking Coca-Cola up into their nose. And I'm like, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> mm -hmm. It was bizarre. And it's this reminded me a bit of Troma, right? Because these are typical Troma characters. Yes, these yes. sort of punked up punked up um, high on cocaine or whatever uh, driving down the street and acting crazy just their dialogue was insanely hilarious the, there's a girl in the back seat named Nina and she is barely wearing anything on top a uh, dude named hot dog and ripper and baby pig <laughs> one of them even has kind of like a piggish nose and they're they're just shouting junk back and forth to me like like nina at one point picks up a photo and shows uh, it to ripper in the front seat and says this was me when i was only one year old and he goes already selling your twat huh and she's like, <laughs> <"F> you. <laughs> like, what? Just, just dogging on this girl but then he hits a bump or something and cocaine spills all over the floor which pisses him off so he stops the car turns around and says you're all going to pick that up every single last gram. And what did they do? They literally stop <laughs> with razor blades and start to scrape cocaine off of the seats. And I'm like, is this is this really where this movie <laughs> yeah. is choosing to spend its time? But then um, the guy who's holding this razor blade and is um, scraping up this cocaine sees that uh, Nina has some cocaine spilled down her pretty much open shirt. And so with the razor blade, he starts scraping the cocaine up her belly, and she's looking at him like, like it's kind of a turn-on. And he starts scraping it up towards her breast and up over her nipple in this sort of dangerous way. And, I mean, what an interesting scene. <laughs> this it it was. was strange. Like, it just seemed very out of place. Like, yeah. Whatever. I, I don't have any problem with nudity. You, know, I, you come to expect that from these types of movies. But, like, it, it was just so random. It had nothing to do with anything. It was, cl like, it was clearly just, let's get a long close-up of her naked breast. Yeah. With this, with with the razor blade, you know, going over her nipple, and eventually he does cut her, which I thought maybe would have some significance, but it doesn't. No, well, thankfully not on her nipple because that would be scary. You're right. Not it was just on her breast. You're right. This scene apparently was pretty controversial and got cut out of the release in a lot of places. Uh, in fact, when it was put on home video and that kind of thing, in a number of countries. Um, they cut this scene out. It's one of the more notorious scenes in the movie, apparently. But uh, it's it's out there now on uh, anything you can find. Like on Shudder. We watched it on Shudder, right? We saw the fully uncut yeah. version. 
Yeah, and that's the, I mean the thing is you could easily cut it because it has nothing to do with anything. He's, I mean it's just yeah. It's just for erotic stimulation. I mean that's the only thing that it's for. <laughs> and then so eventually like they're just sitting on the side of the road in this stolen car snorting more cocaine than I've ever <laughs> well I have never really seen any cocaine but uh, <laughs> so any cocaine would be more than I'd seen but yeah I've seen <laughs> But uh, <laughs> but eventually the cops pull up and chase them, and they end up uh, outside the movie theater, and then the movie theater door is mysteriously open for them, so they end up in the theater too. And one would think that there would be – I just don't even know. Like I was thinking, oh, okay, well, now the story is going to get interesting because they're, they're in there. there too, and there's going to be some kind of intrigue. No, I mean it was just – more getting bodies. more people in there to right to get chased <laughs> around and killed. You're right. It just sort of begs the question, why did we spend so much time getting getting to know these characters and their cocaine habit in the car when they're just going to pop in and just be more victims in the movie? I think part of the reason for it was so that they could showcase their pretty fucking rad soundtrack. Yes. How did they get all of these huge rock bands from oh, the eighties to do this. I mean, I guess they must have just paid for it. I, I don't know. But it's got a great eighties rock soundtrack with oh. huge name bands and performers. And this is my jam. I mean hair metal, heavy metal in the eighties. I mean there's a whole shot, uh, a whole list of them in the credits at the beginning of the movie and my mouth just dropped. I'm like, we're gonna hear this in this film. Like Motley Crue and I mean, just Billy Idol, maybe Black Sabbath. I don't remember. I didn't write them all down, but yeah. huge names. Yeah, and and actually, that was a great aspect of this movie too, and I think contributed a lot to my enjoyment of it. Like you said, you got to kind of shut your brain off for this one. Just go with the flow, and there's just a lot of blood and a lot of gore and a lot of senseless stuff happening and characters you don't care about, but it's all happening to this absolutely awesome rock and eighties type metal hard rock soundtrack, which, but there is also a score. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I really liked the score. I mean, even in just the opening scene, the opening scene, um, in the subway, there's probably the first five minutes of the movie. There's no dialogue. You just are seeing the actors, but it's set against this score. Um, and I was impressed right away. Claudio Simonetti, I guess is how you say it. I don't know. How's your Italian? He did a ton of music for, obviously, for Argento, and we love Argento's. He was the composer for Suspiria. Yeah. Uh, Deep Red, Profundo Rosso that we did, which I absolutely love the music for. Obviously, this one and a lot of the ones that came after it, like opera. and Oh, yeah, it's good. I mean, that's another thing. And there's almost just a whole genre, isn't there, of uh -huh. scores for Italian horror films of the 60s and 70s <laughs> and 80s, right? It's just well, like yeah. it has a particular feel, and it's good. It's like gritty, and it's kind of intense, and it's a little synthy, and mm -hmm. there's just something about it that's just unique, right, to, to what yep. we were getting on the other side of the, of the ocean at that time. Just really fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <sighs> You know, so then everybody's back uh, in the theater. I don't know. Oh, and then finally, at some point, the people in the balcony are just sitting around uh, at this point, like waiting to be rescued. And they hear something, and they're like, oh, we're being rescued. So most of them start taking down the barricade. Mm -hmm. But George and Cheryl and uh, Kathy and Ken are like, no, don't, you know, it you're going to let the demons in here, but nobody's listening. And so as it turns out, the demons are coming. And that's where you get the great shot that's on the box art of oh. these demons like coming up. <clears throat> it's really just up a hallway or up a staircase or something in the theater. Um, but it kind of looks like they're cresting a hill and um, they're lit from behind and their eyes are glowing and it's just this mob of demons and it looks it looks really cool. Yeah, um, apparently that, that eye effect uh, was something that um, the director came up with on the spur of the moment uh, and it was achieved, I thought they used lights or something, but it was just little pieces of reflective tape that they put over their eyes. And huh. 
just kind of obliquely shown a light at them, and it looks fantastic, right? Scary. Yeah, it looks really cool. Mm. <laughs> I mean, if you turn your mind off to the fact that their eyes haven't glowed before or since (laughs) (laughs) but but that's okay it it looks great and that's i guess kind of you know the big showdown where again the mob of demons attacks the theater goers but um cheryl and george and ken and kathy crawl underneath what's left of the rubble and they get out Mm. but as soon as they get out um, Kathy is acting weird like she's only semi-conscious at first and then uh, she starts talking weird like asking them who they are like who are you who am I she, she turns into a demon pretty quickly and they kill her I don't rem- I guess Ken like beats her down with a chair oh yeah. but then there was another really cool effect after mm-hmm. he beat her down with the chair she's on all fours fours Mm -hmm. like on her knees and on her hands and her back starts to arch and then it splits open and a like a fully formed demon emerges out of her back (laughs) again again not at all in keeping with what we've seen so far but so cool (laughs) yeah it's it's pretty awesome i mean it, it it makes no sense whatsoever it doesn't even seem like physically possible but it's an awesome effect and that's another thing i think you'll see on the box art um this face and i thought the makeup was quite good you know and the makeup on this thing i thought we'd see more of this demon i thought thought this would be like the big bad monster demon that would right. be kind of in their craw for a while and uh he just kind of comes and goes i'm not sure if we ever see what ends up happening to him i don't remember i i i know that it it scratches or bites ken Mm. um and then and so ken knows he's gonna turn so he tries to run away but they follow him into the lobby and (laughs) and and he's turning and he's begging george to kill him because he doesn't want to be a demon and he pulls a freaking samurai sword like off the wall or something (laughs) (laughs) yes in this theater they've got one hanging there (laughs) and then and and so uh he does he turns phil he begs uh george to kill him so george does (laughs) and then and then kathy is For some reason, I don't remember, not Kathy, Cheryl, is alone in the theater and, like, the demons are, like, surrounding her. And so in comes George George. on a motorcycle (laughs) with the samurai sword. (laughs) And, And he, like... He rides up to where Kathy is, and, like, he's slicing demons along the way, and he grabs her and throws her on the back of his motorcycle, and then they just do laps around the inside of the theater. (laughs) It's like... It's like nine-year-old Todd in the 80s wrote this movie, right? <laughs> All right, then he's got a samurai sword. He's going to be on a motorcycle, and he's going to slash <laughs> demons as he's driving by with the girl on the back. It's, it's great. It's <laughs> oh, great. It's fantastic. And then, because why not, a giant helicopter falls through the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the other the other thing that I do like about this scene, the samurai scene, is that we get to see a lot of the characters from early in the movie as as demons now, mm. um, and that was kind of fun. Like Tony the pimp is one of them. The uh, the sexy redhead oh, usherette yes. who we haven't even mentioned. Who played her? Was that Fiora Argento? Is that who? Oh, or was she a different role? Um, I know that Fiora or Fiore, however you say her name, is in the movie. No, that was, she was Hannah. Um, so I'm not sure who uh, the the sexy redhead was, um, but she is a zon- or a demon at this point, which surprised me because early on in the movie, I assumed that she was part of the whole demon conspiracy. Yes, um, she was so mysterious, but, and she's wandering around, uh-huh. and she has got that weird look, and. She's closing curtains and stuff like yeah. But anyway, she's she's a demon in this scene. But then you're right there, like, wait a second, do you hear that? <laughs> and then 
a whole helicopter <laughs> just falls <laughs> through the roof. No. Just like descends through did, the roof. Did I miss something here where a helicopter like landed or something? No. It just... No, we had never <laughs> seen a helicopter before. <laughs> this was this was the best. This at this point oh I was God, like, it was yeah. So funny. Again, 8-year-old Todd. And then a helicopter is going to fall from the ceiling. And they jump to the helicopter and there's still demons in there and the helicopter by the way looks fake as hell. Uh-huh. But he does manage to get it started a little bit and the blades spin around and cut a couple demons. You know, this movie's a lot like Dead Alive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I feel like Dead Alive owes a lot to this film. It's it's really the same kind of thing, right? Just a whole bunch of gore. It, By the end, it's well, just... and yeah, it has a very Return of the Living Dead vibe to it, also. Right. But yeah, okay. So then, well, yeah, they they he. <laughs> it's so stupid that he starts <laughs> the rotor and it kills a bunch of them, and then, in a completely inexplicable way, he somehow rigs up some sort of like pulley system that <laughs> shoots them up to the roof. I, I have no idea how that worked. <sighs> yeah. But they get up to the roof where they find the masked man from the beginning of the movie. There is no explanation, nothing. Like, this would be the part of most movies where he would, like, divulge his evil plan. Mm -hmm. But but no, he's just up there, and he tries to throw them back in the hole, and eventually uh, they get power over him, and the two of them, like, are both, like, pushing down on his back, um, and they push his head down onto these huge metal spikes, Mm -hmm. um, like the rebar sticking out from the roof. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And then, okay, so then, you know, big reveal. They run to the edge of the building, and they look out, and the city is like an apocalyptic hellscape. Like, this has not just been confined to the theater, or if it originally was, it has burst out now, um, and there are demons everywhere. Like within the last hour, basically. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, we saw the punks come in about halfway through the movie, and everything seemed normal then. And the movie's really only like an hour and a half long, so hour yeah. and forty. So, yeah, within the last forty-five minutes or so, the entire city's been covered with demons, and and people have the wherewithal and the means to fight back because that's kind of what's happening. There are fires everywhere and stuff, and. What, they they somehow get down to the ground. What, do they rappel down or, or climb the ladder down or something? I don't remember. And there's a, a car that pulls up, and it's full of, like, it's like a, there's, like, a family in there. Well, it's like a Jeep, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and there's a, a guy and his wife and daughter and their pres son, presumably, and she, you know, jumps up, and she's shooting demons, and uh, get in, get in the car. And it's funny. It's kind of hilarious. It's hilarious. It's, it's clearly this, like, very suburban domestic family who suddenly, again, within the last 30 minutes, has, you know, learned how to take care of themselves and survive. Yeah, this all-American, like, blonde eight-year-old yes. with, like, a huge assault rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up a gun from the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah these, there's more There's more weapons in the back. And, like, he picks up, a mach like, an Uzi. Like <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh. And they start driving off, you know, into the, not literally the sunset, but start driving off. And the, George is like, where are we going? And they're like, the countryside. We saw some lights in the sky. We think maybe, I don't know what they think. There's humanity there or something. Yeah. Then the credits start to roll. So I thought the movie was over and I almost turned it off, but I'm glad I didn't because it wasn't over. <laughs> yeah, that was an did interesting. You, did you stick around? Yeah. Did, I was going to say, did you stick around for that last part? <laughs> I did, but that was a real interesting fake out, wasn't it? Like the credits start to uh, roll, then suddenly, uh, you know, it's just showing them. And I thought, oh, there might be a little something, you know, that they show or whatever, because there's still action happening behind them. And then suddenly the credits stop rolling because uh, Cheryl has turned into a demon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a bit of a struggle in the car and they kick her out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just leave her in the road. And, and keep driving. <laughs> I I I thought I thought that I really liked it. It I did amused too. me. It made me smile. And you know, it's kind of a subversion because she was the first character we were introduced to. She was the nice girl. Um you just expect that she's going to be the final girl. 
Yeah. And then they she turns into a demon. They just throw her out of the car. <laughs> they keep going. <laughs> and, and by the way, um, her boyfriend or whatever, because they had their moments and things like that, doesn't even seem to care. <laughs> just, no. Well, they just guy. met a couple hours ago. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> but it seemed like they were trying to build something, you know, between them. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And he, by the way, he was uh, he was pretty stud. I mean, by the end of it, he kind of looked like Rambo, right? He has yeah. had grease on his face, and his shirt was ripped in all the right places, and uh, he looked like a Bruce Willis, you know, of 1985 right there at the end. <laughs> His his transformation was the most impressive of all. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he ended up being the hero uh, in the end. <laughs> but regardless of the fact that we barely saw him through the movie until those key scenes at the end, right? True. And that was just the way the movie was as far as characters went. The movie didn't really care about the characters, right? No. Yeah, we didn't really follow them. There was no through line, no, no backstories, no subplots, no nothing. Uh, just here's a bunch of demons in the theater ripping people up. Mm-hmm. And I was fine with it. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't read anything about it before. Like I said, I've seen some imagery. I may have seen a couple of, you know, just real quick clips um, of some of the special effects and things. Uh, but I didn't know a whole lot going in. But this is kind of what I expected and kind of what I was hoping for. Mm. Um, it was a fun, no-brainer, eye candy kind of movie. Um, and for the most part, it was pretty fast paced. I mean, there were some strange detours, like the the, <laughs> the people in the car, you know, the punks in the car or whatever, which was odd. But you know, it, it never got slow or boring. No, and it was fun. I I had fun watching it. I, I might one day even watch it again. <laughs> I probably would, especially having watched it a first time. You know, I mean, knowing that this isn't going to be a more subtle atmospheric uh, Argento type production but it's going to be more along the lines of a Fulci sort of gore fest that I'm fine with that sometimes that's what I want to see mm -hmm. you know sometimes that's what I'm in the mood for and this movie like kind of like Dead Alive just delivers it in spades yeah this is what you're coming here for we're going to go all out and put all of our money into this and I guess the movie was quite successful in Italy it beat out a lot of other more popular films in the states anyway at the time um, and again, spawned a sequel, which I hear is not as good, but I'd be interested in watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, Craig, this is good. I'm glad to hear your final assessment on this because I always worry a little bit when we turn on these Italian horror films, um, whether or not Craig is going to enjoy himself. So I'm, uh, I'm glad that this time around you, uh, you found something to like here. Yeah, I liked it. It was, you know, good 80s fun. I've said it a bazillion times. It'll come as no surprise to anybody who's listened to any of our episodes. I love practical effects, mm. um, and they just they abound here. And they look good and creepy and bloody and gross. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I give it a thumbs up. Cool. Me too. Well, thanks again for listening to another episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. You can find us online. Just search for Two Guys and a Chainsaw. We're slowly putting more videos up on our YouTube channel. Please go there uh, and subscribe to that channel if you haven't. We want to build up to 100 subscribers so we can do some more stuff with that. And also just kind of build a, a, a different kind of audience. Also, if you have a request for us, we're still doing requests uh, this month. So just uh, log on to our website or our Facebook page. Leave us a comment in one of those places, and we'll try to get to it as soon as possible. Until next time, I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. With two guys and a chainsaw. Ah!